get along. Before we talk about North Africa, we need to talk about white slavery first. The Euro critics like to throw the word slave around to explain away any DNA results that come outside of their non-African paradigm. They spend way too much time telling the world that African people have never had any inclination to go anywhere on this earth. That it was impossible for them to have gone anywhere. They attempt to back us into a corner with slavery explanations for everything, many times with no evidence. But today, they've been backed into a corner. Let's take a look. This page, Ethnic Genome Project, is another homemade Eurocentric blog attempting to rationalize our very real presence in ancient Europe and Carthaginian times. Here he's discussing the fact that Sicilian people have an average of 10% Sub-Saharan African DNA. He claims he's publishing these results like he's some sort of academic journal and immediately starts racializing the results in the first line of his paragraph. He admits that Sicilians have an above average amount of black DNA, then immediately says, so do all white people. It's obvious that this cognitive dissonance has left his mind confused. The study that he posted states that the presence of a typical African marker in Sicily could have been due to the Phoenician colonization or to the Muslim conquest of that place in the 9th century. The authors then go on to hypothesize that an input of genes from Africa to Sicily was brought there by Phoenician migration. The study he posted here tells us that a hundred unrelated Sicilians had phenotypes and antigens that are considered to be African markers. They also say that there are multiple African genes present in Sicily. We see right here that all of this is described as a manifestation of the continuing dissemination of the original African mutation from Phoenician times. The author of this blog then goes on to make his own story. He says that African DNA likely came into Rome with black men dropped off at a slave drop-off point in Sicily. He says he hasn't seen this proven anywhere, and that's because he just made it up. That's why he hasn't seen it proven anywhere. In fact, it was rare for the Romans to even be enslaving black people in the first place. Let's remember that these guys always say there's barely any black people in North Africa. Now all of a sudden there's an unlimited supply of black slaves. This blog has a comment section and it was full of the same tired Eurocentric denials. So I think it's time that we get black to reality. It goes without saying that the world didn't start for black people 500 years ago with Europeans and the slave trade. But you wouldn't know this looking at the comments on this homemade blog. Here Big Al is asking if this African DNA wasn't actually the magical North African Caucasian variety. He says that North Africa was a diverse place under Carthaginian and Moorish rule, but there were only two or three black Africans there until the rest were enslaved by Muhammad to keep them company. As we move deeper into this cesspool, we see these people denying the percentages based off of hearsay information that they heard about a totally different country. And of course here, they're mentioning European slave trade again. He then sets himself up for failure by saying Hollywood other Eurocentrics and Afrocentrics have been pushing the idea of Sicilians being mixed with black African blood without having any evidence to back it up, despite the fact that he was typing this on a page that was presenting that very evidence. That's too bad, Eurocritics, because your punishment continues right now and today. Let's do this. You see for yourself. You sure that African DNA isn't really Caucasian? You can see right here. FYAB is rare among Caucasian and Asian populations, but is the most common phenotype in black people over two thirds of us, actually. It's another one of those things that ties us together. We can see here that the Nigerians are used as an example for GM5171. 
I've clearly shown you how easy it is to verify that these results are black African. The authors hypothesize that these blood types came into Sicily with the Phoenicians. So, the Euro critics cry about it and make another excuse, and that's too bad. When DNA results are published for Italy and Central Europe, they're never interpreted as slave blood. It's always just a glorious mix of Europeans going freely all over Europe, starting kingdoms and mixing together. But this couldn't be any further from the truth, and it will be demonstrated today, right here on this channel. I have existed from the morning of the world, and I shall exist until the last star falls from the heavens. Although I have taken the form of Caius Caligula, I am all men as I am no man, and so I am a god. Italy. I always wondered, why do so many Italians look so different from the old Roman Italians? And why do so many of these people look like they were from somewhere in the East? That's because many of these people have ancestors who were brought to Rome as slaves by the Romans. Many Italians take DNA tests and wonder why their results keep coming up with high percentages of Asia Minor DNA. Here we take a look at a few posts on the Family Tree DNA forum. Anna Zio says his results are 76% European and 24% Asia Minor. The reality of being a slave child is too much for him, so he starts rationalizing and making up stories the way Eurocentrics do. He denies an influx of non-Romans into Italy, which is a lie. He says there's no research to support that, which is another lie, and I have it right here today. Then he says a lot of the slaves in Italy were Italians, and that is the definition of lying to yourself and Eurocentric political correctness. Another Italian he knows came up 28% Asia Minor, with no explanation in his family history. And he's found other Italians experiencing similar results, with people reporting as high as 50%. Another poster shows 9% Asia Minor, then makes up a story about a bunch of Turks settling in Italy, which is yet another Eurocentric fantasy cop-out. As usual, the Eurocritics start attacking the DNA company or coming up with theories. Here a guy is asking why Germanic-speaking Britain shows Germanic DNA. And Azio finishes up by asking us, why does Family Tree DNA give Italians such big levels of Asia Minor DNA? He blames it on flaws when he should be blaming it on the Romans who enslaved their ancestors in Asia Minor. Today, we'll be taking a look at two studies of the Roman slave supply and economy. They're going to let us know that the Balkans and Anatolia were the leading provinces of labor in the Roman Empire. In North Africa, everything's because of the slave trade. But when something odd shows up in European DNA, it's always thanks to magical migrations towards Europe that never happened the way they envisioned. Anazio says the influx of non-Romans into Italy is overstated and there is no research on this. But right here today, the research exists. He says a lot of the slaves were Italians, but that's how he wishes it was. We also need to know going into this that black slaves in Rome were rare and when they did show up, they were associated with the prestigious. Let's remember that the Nubians had a private meeting with Octavian, and it's written in the Latin that these Nubians came out with their heart's desire. They then proceeded to walk over his face for hundreds of years. Roman slavery was built on Greek and Hellenistic institutions. It is undisputed that Rome was the largest slave society in world history. No empire has enslaved as many people as these Roman warriors. There is no debating this. Movies are made about this, and it's celebrated today. Walter Scheidel writes here that slaves, numbering in the millions and widely dispersed, accounted for a non-trivial share of its total population. This slave population was more than big enough to leave its trace on Europe. In terms of duration and sheer numbers, this dwarfs the transatlantic slave trade and the Muslim slave trade combined. Like, Scheidel writes here that enslavement and the slave trade constituted the principal means of geographical and social mobility in the ancient world. This is a much more realistic look at what the ancient world was really like in Caucasian areas in ancient times. As we'll see today, the colossal scale of human suffering that is the Roman slave supply 
must count as one of the darkest periods of human history. And it was white Caucasians who bore the brunt of the worst slavery known to mankind. The things those people went through were horrible. Now they pretend it never happened while pretending that they themselves were the Romans. Many of these Euro critics are themselves the descendants of Roman slaves who had nothing to do with Hellenism or the Roman power. They put on the cloak of their masters and then tell us that we should study some other history. That it has nothing to do with us. These slaves are rank hypocrites and I'm going to show you to your face today. So don't forget to subscribe. Lord. Give me my ring. No. Yes. You do not dare. Prince. You do not dare. We're going to take a look at slavery in the Roman economy and the Roman slave supply, which are papers written by Walter Scheidel. Here we see that anywhere from 100 million to 200 million slaves could have existed during the Roman period, and this is dependent on overall numbers and manumissions. Black slavery to the New World by comparison was only around 10 million, even if it was 20 million. Tens of millions of more people were enslaved by the Romans, and for hundreds of years longer, too. Not only that, American slavery was much more modest in scale, whereas Roman slavery is described as a conglomerate of slaveries. And this is a reality. I'm not here to point a finger or laugh at slavery today, but we need to be realistic. The enslavement of Caucasians during the Hellenistic and Greek period is something Eurocentric never factor into their white supremacy theories. And when they do, it's always a black slave. But the fantasy is over now because we know exactly where these people came from. The origins of newly captured slaves shifted with the geographical spread of Roman imperialism. Meaning, wherever you see a Roman on that map, somebody was a slave from that area and in towards Germany beyond those areas. The peninsula of Italy down to the end of the third century, northern Italy, the Iberian Peninsula, the southern Balkans, North Africa, western Anatolia in the second century BC, Gaul, the central Balkans, Anatolia, and the Levant in the first century BC, Britain, Germany, Dacia, and Parthia from the first century onwards, all added slaves to the Romans. In addition, large numbers of slaves were purchased from beyond the Roman frontiers. Right. During the Republic, the Balkans and Anatolia may have been the leading foreign providers of slave labor. Not Africa. Time to retire your lies. You like lying, don't you? Roman merchants used to barter wine for Celtic slaves with modern estimates of 15,000 a year. That's a lot of wine. But it wasn't just the Balkans and Anatolia providing unlimited slaves to the Romans. White supremacy warmongers worshipped the Black Sea like it's some kind of holy lake because blue eyes, white skin, and blonde hair first allegedly showed up around here. The reality of their lives is that the Black Sea region and the Caucasian Mountains region has been well established as a major source of slaves since the archaic Greek period. Let's remember that the next Let's remember that the next time the word Caucasian comes dribbling out of Phoenician Seventh's mouth. Let's remember that the next time they present another romanticized image of ancient Europe as if it was the Lord of the Rings. This tradition of enslaving classic white European areas of the world continued in the late antiquity. That means for the entire ancient period, the average slave we should be picturing is a person 
we would imagine living in one of those areas that the Eurocentrics say has been 100% white for thousands of years. I find your lack of faith disturbing. And this has been known for years. Together with Free Germany, that northeastern periphery must have accounted for most imports once the Roman Empire had reached its maximum extension. You see it with your own eyes here today. What this tells us is that at the maximum classic moment of Roman history, the city was filled with slaves who looked exactly like the average white person walking amongst us in the streets today. This is not hyperbole and it's not racist. This is reality. The Romans didn't need magical black people to kidnap. All they needed was you. Today's Anglo world loves to tie itself to Rome and act like they're its successors while lording it over us and telling us to stop studying Egypt. When the reality is these Eurocentrics were natural born slaves from the beginning of the archaic Greek period. Again, this has been known for years, but all we get is a costume fantasy and a white history month pat on the back. This is why they use generic catch-all terms like Caucasian so they can attach Europeans to any and everybody like they were all riding together but we see the facts say they most certainly were not and never were. This explains their Eurocentric insecurity and why they divide up African people into pieces. Listen to my nigga, you better be prepared for the new heaven tip. Regata, regata, haha. <laughs> So we know once and for all that the average slave in a Roman movie should be any of the people from the Caucasian mountains, Germany, Anatolia, or Northeastern Europe because they provide most of the labor to their Roman masters. As the empire expanded, the rest of the Europeans themselves became servants of the Romans. This has been recorded since at least the Archaic Greek period, not mentioning powerhouses like Assyria before this. What did the ancient Greeks have to say about the people talking the most today? Aristotle wrote that the peoples of cold countries generally, and particularly those of Europe, are full of spirit, but deficient in skill and intelligence. And this is why they continue to remain comparatively free, but attain no political development and show no capacity for governing others. Aristotle was there, and Aristotle had it right. This explains why we never hear about a legendary kingdom in these Anglo-Saxon, Scandinavian, and Celtic type areas. They had social stratification and a little bit of gold, but they never had any relevant kingdoms that we can actually name in ancient history. This is why white supremacy history starts with their Greek masters. They claim Greek history as their own after a famous Greek philosopher just got through telling us they were deficient in intelligence and had no political development. Contrast this with the Nubians who not only had the white crown of Egypt and royal burials the same size as Egyptian burials in the pre-dynastic period, they also had scorpions, palace facades, sacred boats, the Oars Falcon, and all this is ignored so they can tell us another fantasy story about a Lord of the Rings version of Europe that we're supposed to envy. Aristotle says here that the peoples of Asia have skill and intelligence, are deficient in spirit, and this is why they continue to be subjects and slaves. Subjects and slaves are how the people of Asia are described by this Greek philosopher. Compare this to the image of the super Caucasian built up by Phoenician 7, where we see some huge Caucasian empire stretching from Ireland to India, south of the Sahara, all the way to Kenya. This is all a fantasy, and they can only be further disappointed. Did I mention that Scheidel's study of the Roman slave supply 
was one of the first in decades? Why so long? The European and Anglo world is embarrassed and humiliated at their subjugation under the hands of an empire they had nothing in common with. Whereas Europeans have aped and copied the Romans for years, African cultures across the continent, from Egypt to South Africa, share many long-standing cultural and genetic characteristics. Here we see that black slaves from as far away as Somalia and the occasional import from India made for comparatively rare but high prestige retainers. The important thing to remember here is that black slaves were not easy to come across in Roman times. They were much too busy with various mechanisms ensuring a continued flow of Caucasian slaves from Europe and Asia instead. We see here that Anatolia looms large in the literary tradition meaning the Romans wrote down a lot of times that they enslaved a bunch of people in Turkey. Phrygian slaves in particular had long become a stock motif, as in a Caucasian Phrygian was the poster child for a slave in many parts of the empire. Get me a Phrygian. Lydia, Caria, Cappadocia likewise garnered attention while the Syrians are also frequently mentioned as slaves. Now you're starting to see what I meant when I said many Italians are mixed with slave and have never been pure uncut Romans. Massive Jewish uprisings in the 1st and 2nd centuries AD made periodic contributions to the slave markets. So what we see is that the Romans had a well-oiled machine of slavery to the point that it is a conglomerate of slaveries. And every last one of these areas mentioned so far is an area the Eurocritics worship as a precious Indo-European white homeland or the homeland of their white brother. The Romans keep things up with periodic enslavement events. There didn't need to be a war. Not only were there periodic enslavement events, there were the incessant wars too. I always go into anything Roman assuming they exaggerate their numbers a bit. Having said that, the point they left behind is that if you lost an official war to them, they were enslaving everybody. Every personality and type was gone. 58 to 77,000 in the Samnite War, 150,000 at the sack of Epirus. In less than 150 years, the Romans have recorded enslaving up to 731,000 people. And every last one of their descendants walks around with his head up his ass. We all know about Caesar's famous claim that he enslaved a million Gauls in France. I don't know if there's a Roman numeral for a million, but I do know he was trying to say that a whole lot of people were sent straight to the hell that is Roman enslavement. Trajan records 500,000 in Dacia, and the Egyptian records point to a natural increase in production at the expense of purchased slaves. And do believe that these slaves reproduced and brought more slaves into the Roman economy. The end result is what we see today, a bunch of people mixed with slave blood, and that's a fact. Mr. Scheidel tells us here that if millions of slaves lived in the Roman Empire, as seems very likely, many had to be the offspring of slaves because alternative sources would not have sufficed to sustain the whole system. If many slaves descended from slaves, the manumission could not have been common. Having said that, let's take a quick look at a couple of websites that the average person might visit on a random day when searching for basic information on Roman slavery. This British website is primary homework help. In their Roman section, we see them asking, who were the slaves? It's been known for years that the slaves were primarily Italian, Spanish, Anatolian, Eastern European, North African, German, Dacian, Parthian, Celtic, Syrian, British, Carthaginian for a time, and also Greek. How does primary homework help answer this question? Slaves were mainly prisoners captured in battle. They came from any country in the Roman Empire, including Britain. First of all, I wouldn't call these countries, but I would call them tribal affiliations. Second of all, notice how they gloss over who exactly was a slave and see how quickly they insert England into the Roman story, except they're always eager to describe themselves as slaves of the empire, since that's really their only connection to Rome anyway. Now follow me for a second. The British never marched on Rome, never declared themselves the kings of Rome. 
They also didn't share in any sort of similar royal power like Rome alongside them either. Yet every time you watch a Roman movie, the Romans speak with a British accent every single time. We must love each other. Contrast this with the Nubians, who had the trappings of power in the pre-dynastic period alongside Later, Kush was crowned king of Upper and Lower Egypt, reuniting the entire Nile Valley for the first time since the height of the New Kingdom. But in mainstream academia around the world, the Nubians are presented as another, lesser, weaker kingdom that even the Greeks never heard of. Whereas the British are presented as somehow prestigious when many of their royal rituals have been created in the 20th century. This is all madness, and it's time to stop worshiping. Cicero wrote that Britain was poor and had nothing but slaves. It was Cicero who wrote that, not an Afrocentric. You can read the Roman historians yourself and find rich Romans with four or five hundred slaves. I remember one sad story where Nero allowed 600 slaves to be crucified when he could have saved them. It really was sick. Primary homework help asks us here, how many slaves were there? We get another Eurocentric answer. No one is sure how many slaves existed in the Roman Empire. Here they just outright lie to the children because the answer is too horrible for these children for some reason. They can pick up many Roman historians who can read about all sort of enslavement events. This is another example of Eurocentric babysitting of people's feelings. This is the white version of political correctness. How many Roman slaves were there? Keep it ambiguous so it can be anything. This is why I bring you guys specialized experts to this channel rather than throwing anything on the screen like Super Egyptian does. The Roman slavery, in actual fact, was the worst slavery in mankind's history, and it goes down as the worst chapter of them all. And the memory of it lasted a long time. Imagine being sent to the mines, wielding a hammer that weighs 5 to 10 pounds, 12 hours a day. There would be shafts that needed the rock broken in a low tunnel laying on your side. And if you didn't do it, you got beat by a Roman soldier. This was for a thousand years in the entire history of Greece before it. There's no telling what you were doing before that. Probably still being a slave. But we need to fast forward. To prevent tax avoidance, emperors immobilized the tax base by tying peasants to the land and guildsmen to their craft. These events paved the road to serfdom and feudal Europe. Here we see that the legacy the Romans left to Europe was a legacy of slavery because 99% of the people were shackled to land belonging to the king. Our great republic. Instead, the Eurocentrics imagined sword fights and romantic jousting matches. Here we see the Holy Roman Empire of the Franks. As you look toward the east, we see the Slavs. The word slave is adapted from a large group of people living in Europe. Here we see again natural European people being associated closely with being slaves. This is where we start thinking about natural born slaves. If Herodotus is the father of history, then the ancestors of most white European people are natural born slaves because the Black Sea and the Caucasian Mountains were a slave center since the archaic Greek period. History begins with this enslavement in Eurocentric terms according to their own rules. Contrast this with the Nubians who enter history two millennium before this with the white crown of Egypt and the Oris Falcon. No wonder the Euro clowns are so obsessed with us. Perhaps you think you're being treated unfairly? That even inside Europe, resident insiders could be enslaved in 1500. When Columbus was exploring the Caribbean, white people were still being enslaved inside Europe. If a black slave was in some location there back then, it was highly likely that a white slave was right beside him. This helps us get rid of this fantasy version of Europe where they all lived happily ever after, after the plague. So insiders could be enslaved, most likely outside of settled regions, so you would just be kidnapped. Here we see that even Northwest 
European Christians living on their own coasts could still be transformed into slaves. And this is true. Entire sections of coastal Europe were depopulated thanks to slave raiding raids from the Turks and Barbary pirates. You see, we don't play on this channel. I'm going to show you El Haji Taraji, who was a Barbary pirate operating off Morocco. Here it says what a fine specimen he is. And again, the Euro critics have no explanation for this but to say he's a slave when we see now that they themselves are the slaves who envy us a great deal. Here we see that well after 1500, visitors to Russia still recorded inhabitants describing themselves as servants and slaves. <laughs> no. Information like this is never presented in such a fashion at these Eurocentric school districts in America. In South Asia, voluntary enslavement was widespread. It's also unlikely that any more than a small portion of these people were able to make the double or triple border crossings back to their homes. Among those who were launched across the Atlantic, the Sahara, or the Indian Ocean, only a minuscule number probably ever returned to their homes. We're down to 1500, and it's still the enslavement of Europe, and it still has an end. Michael Hoffman explained that in the 18th century, even without the institution of slavery in Europe, white people were still subjected to slave-like conditions. As we look at this now, it's just pure barbarism and long-term barbarism. In the 18th century, in Britain and America, the Industrial Revolution spawned the factory system, whose first laborers were miserably oppressed white children. The Sweet Boy's Lament was an 1824 London poem about child chimney sweepers, whose job it was to climb down filthy, scary chimneys and clean them. Back to this homemade Eurocentric genome blog. This poster has joined the bandwagon, denying that Sicilians have 10% African blood, while supplying no evidence of his own from the lab. He claimed that the author wrote that it was a hypothesis and has not been proven. Once again, these people exercise their weakness and laziness. The author wrote that the timing of it coming with the Phoenicians was a hypothesis. The phenotypes and antigens are very real. They also said it could have come with the Muslim conquest, which would be the Moors. They'll reach for their slave crutch and forget that there's supposed to hardly be any black people the further north you go in Africa. So they start conjuring another lie. The phenotypes and antigens have been measured in the lab. None of, none of the people in these comments presented any lab evidence but their own personal Eurocentric feelings. And that's too bad. Old Big Al says he's not caught up in fantasy theories, propaganda, and extreme political correctness. Do you see how far gone these people are? He says, it gets irritating when people try to deny your true ethnic group their true heritage. That's how sick and hypocritical these people are. Then he has the nerve to say Hollywood has really twisted the actual history. The same Big Al who asked about magic Caucasian North African slaves. Then he claims logic and evidence while presenting no evidence. Immediately followed by him talking about Caucasoids again. He lives in such a fantasy world that he believes the pure and precious Italians are a bunch of Latin, Celtic, and Lombards. He basically just chose some names. All of that may be true, but Italy has absorbed an untold number of slaves from Asia Minor and many more places. More slaves than any other place in history came into Europe. But when it came to Eurocentric population fantasies, they never factor in their own slavery, but factor in exaggerated slavery stories for us. <laughs> If only all Rome had just one. Big Al himself says that his relatives look a bit Arabic and then rationalizes his slavery by saying these groups are Caucasoids, which is really pathetic. Yep, I was a slave, but I had a Caucasoid master. Is this how low Western civilization is getting? The white supremacist reality is this. These slaves were added to all these Caucasian populations that have now become a mishmash of slave blood. A person can be 100% white and still be 100% slave. This is not hyperbole, we just saw the evidence for ourselves. 
So let's think about this the next time they lecture us about being carried away somewhere as a slave when they themselves were the ones carried off. We should never let natural born slaves lecture us anymore and we can't afford these petty arguments with them. Instead, all we get is a Eurocentric glossed over version of history where the slaves are now imitating their masters and telling us the Roman legacy is with them. The Romans left them nothing but slavery they spent all the money, they used up the buildings, and took all your women. And all this other stuff is just flattery and imitation. And that's the truth. The Romans weren't Celtic people. They weren't Anglo-Saxons. They weren't Bosque or Germanic. They were Latin. All the rest of these Eurocentrics are wannabes trying to claim the fame, and they need to study their own history. Europe is a story of subjugation and misery, all the way down in modern times. Look at World War II. We've seen today that slavery was the destiny of much of Europe for a long time. The nature of the Romans, the incessant wars, the constant revolts, and the global economy all point to a well-oiled machine of Caucasian slavery that helped build or did build the Roman Empire. This slavery swallowed more people than the transatlantic and Muslim slave trade combined. Let us remember this the next time these Eurocentrics run their face. Let's remember that Felix was one of the most popular slave names amongst the Romans. The next shadow of slavery to rise over Europe was their enslavement by the Turks, Arabs, Black North Africans, and other Muslims. And this was an enslavement that came from the East and the West, reaching all the way to the shores of England. 